So in the previous week, we were talking about uh, Fourier series, and then uh, the last week ended with a note about what happens when a periodic signal goes through an LTI system. So I have a periodic signal E raised to J omega naught T. I pass it through an LTI system. I get H of J omega E raised to J omega naught T. And I had introduced in the in the towards the end of my previous lecture that H of J omega is called frequency response. of the LTI system. Okay, and we'll just uh, consider continuous time system today and then we'll talk about discrete time system in the next class. Now, suppose I have summation of a k e raised to j k omega naught t. I pass it through the LTI system. I'm going to get summation of a k h of j k omega naught e raised to j k omega naught t. Okay, so now let's assume that I have an input signal x, x t whose Fourier series coefficients are given by a k. Then you can readily see that the in the output, the Fourier series coefficient of the output signal y t is given by a k h of j k omega naught. Where does that uh, e uh, that exponential uh, disappear to for the y of t? Why why isn't that included? This is the Fourier series. This is the Fourier series uh, expansion. Remember, uh, the Fourier series expansion is given by xt on this side, and then you write fs, and then you write ak on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. So yt is also periodic. So what are the things we notice? Facts one, yt is periodic. So I input a periodic signal to an LTI system, I get an output which is also a periodic signal. And in fact, YT has the same fundamental period as XT. For the first frequency response, like in the first LTI system that you drew, right. is it supposed to be H of J omega naught? Oh yeah, that's right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. Okay, so just a quick update. So this has to be H of J omega naught. I had, I was missing the omega naught there, so please put a omega naught there. Okay, so one thing you will notice, oh, well, okay, let me ask you for an observation. So if we know that in the input, my Fourier series coefficients are AK, in the output, my Fourier series coefficients are AK times, AK multiplied by H of JK omega naught. What does this mean? What does this mean? 
it means that depending on the amplitude of h of or absolute value of h of jk omega naught a case could get amplified or it could get eliminated let me write it down um, clearly so depending on absolute value of h of jk omega naught the amplitude of kth harmonic in yt can get amplified or diminished Okay, this is the most important or very important uh, outcome of what we have studied so far. And this insight essentially leads to the whole field of what is known as filtering. Okay, in filtering, the goal of the system, goal of the engineer, if the engineer wants to create a filter, the goal of the engineer is to come up with a system, preferably an LTI system, which can amplify or diminish the amplitude of certain harmonics in the output. Okay, so the system should take an input, a signal, and it should amplify certain parts of the signal and it should diminish certain other parts of the signal. That's the whole area. Of, I mean, this, this entire subject is studied under the umbrella of filtering, which is the topic for today's discussion. Okay, any questions so far? There are essentially two types of filter. One is known as frequency shaping filter. And the second one is known as frequency selective filter. A filter is an LTI system and a frequency shaping filter wants to shape the harmonics, shape the output of the harmonics or amplitude of the harmonics, whereas a frequency selective filter wants to select certain frequencies to pass through the system and others to not pass through the system. Okay. Let me give you an example. Okay. Let's say I create an LTI system, which takes the time derivative of the input signal. What is the output going to be? 
what's the output of the derivative of e raised to j omega naught t? Isn't it just uh, uh, j omega naught t? Uh, well, it's j omega naught e raised to. Oh yeah, I forgot the e yeah. raised part. Yeah. Okay, so we see. Okay, so the input. So let's look at the. Let's look at the input. So the input, the amplitude is one. The output, the amplitude is j of omega naught e raised to j omega naught t. So my amplitude has been, depending on the value of omega naught, my amplitude is either increased or it has decreased. So depending on omega naught, um, the amplitude as amplitude can increase or reduce or diminish. This would be my H of J omega naught. So let's look at uh, the values if omega naught is very, very small. So what happens when omega naught is very, very small? When omega naught is small, this number E of E raised to J omega naught T, it's almost like a constant signal. Well, it, when omega naught is zero, this is just a unit signal. But when omega naught is very, very small, let's, let's plot the case when omega naught is very small. This is what the signal is going to look like. So what happens to the output when omega naught is small? Let me write omega naught almost equal to zero. What is the output? The output is almost negligible. A signal which has negligible amplitude because remember this omega naught gets multiplied to the amplitude of the output. Well, uh, amplitude of the, the input signal. So the output is almost negligible. On the other hand, if my omega naught is very, very high, then this looks something like this. This is what the signal is going to look like. And let's say omega naught is 1000. I will have J 1000 E raised to J omega naught T. And I can write J multiplied by 1000 as 1000 E raised to J pi over four, pi over two. E raised to J omega naught T, which is equal to 1000 
Okay, so what do you notice in the output here? So let's look at the two, two figures together. So I consider two cases. One is when omega naught is very, very small, almost equal to zero. And I look at the output from this same, same system. It's the same LTI system. It's D over DT. It's just a derivative um, uh, system, a system that takes the derivative of the input signal. So I look at the output when omega naught is very, very small and the output is almost equal to zero. Whereas when I pick omega naught equals to 1000, which probably is a large number, um, then I see that the output is amplify, amplified by a factor of 1000. The, the strength of the output or the amplitude of the output is magnified or amplified by a factor of 1000, right? What else do you see that happens in the output. So besides the amplification in the amplitude, what else do you observe in the output? Someone in the chat says a uh, phase shift. Oh yeah, oh, I didn't see the chat, thank you. Yes, so we see a phase shift. We, we see that uh, pi over two gets added to the phase of the uh, frequency, uh, what, what should I call it? Phase of the sinusoidal or not sinusoidal, the exponential signal. So your input looks like this. Let's say this is one cycle of the input and the output is going to, it's going to phase shift by pi over two. So the output is going to look like, uh, I think I should extend the time axis. So this is time, this is X of T. And the output is going to look like I'm trying to see whether it's going to go, I think it's gonna go back. So, it's going to look something like this. This is the output Y of T. So the output, the, ma the magnitude is amplified and there is a phase shift in the output signal that we observe. So this is what typically a LTI system would do. Uh, it would amplify or diminish the amplitude and it will add a phase to the output signal. And the best way to represent this, these two quantities, which is a change in the amplitude and the change in the phase is through what is called a Bode plot. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about Bode plot next. Any questions so far in the, on this example? Now, one thing we will notice, let's go back to our original discussion about the frequency shaping filter. So in this case, what we see is that this kind of filter, which is basically just taking the derivative of the input signal, what it seems to do is for very small values of signal, for a very small frequencies, it uh, diminishes the amplitude uh, for very large frequencies, it amplifies the those particular frequencies. So that's shaping the frequency of the input signal. So in the Bode plot, what you do is there are two particular plots. In the along the x axis, along the x axis, we plot log of omega. Along the y axis, the top plot is 20 log absolute value of h of j omega. This is log base 10, by the way. This is not the natural log. 
and then angle of h of j omega. Okay, so in the case of h of j omega equals to j omega, what is the amplitude? What is the absolute value of h of j omega? What would the absolute value be? Wouldn't that be the complex conjugate? Uh, no, this is the absolute value. So oh. well, it should be equal to omega. And what about the angle of h of j omega? That's equal to pi over two. We just talked about in the previous uh, page. So the 20 log j, h of j omega, it's actually going to just be a linear curve because it's log omega on the x, x, x scale and it's 20 log omega in the y scale. So that's just going to look like a linear plot. And the angle, it's going to be pi over two. It's just going to be constant pi over two. This 20 log h of j omega, this is usually measured in decibel, dB decibel. Whereas angle is of course, typically radians or degrees. Oh, actually I should make a small, uh, typically this is frequency. So omega is not the frequency. So I have to do omega over two pi on this scale, if it is Hertz, if the frequency, if it is log frequency and it's measured in Hertz, or rather omega over two pi is measured in Hertz. Okay, so the Bode plot allows us to infer which frequency. So if you look at this particular Bode plot, the smaller frequencies, which is this part, this is the small frequency part. So if you look at the small frequency part, the value, the, the decibel value is small, which means that these frequencies will get eliminated. Whereas if you look at large frequency plot, part of the plot, then we see that the value, the magnitude of 20 log h of j, absolute value of h of j omega is large. And therefore these frequencies will get amplified in the output. Okay. The phase shift remains constant throughout all the frequency range. And that's just the property of the derivative uh, system, derivative LTI system. Okay, any questions so far? Let's just do a quick recap. So one thing we recognized is if we give an input, a sinusoidal, not a sinusoidal, but a periodic input to an LTI system, the output is also going to be periodic but the amplitude of the output will change by a factor of h of j omega. In case you have multiple frequencies in the input, the output will get amplified selectively. 
so some of the ak's will sorry the some of the sinusoidal signals will get amplified some of them will get diminished depending on the absolute value of h of jk omega naught this leads us to talk about filters and there are essentially two types of filters frequency shaping filter and frequency selective filter so instead of trying to talk about what exactly these filters do let's just look at an example which is just taking the derivative of the input signal and we notice that this particular uh, system which is taking the derivative of the input signal the system seems to diminish uh, low frequency signals and it amplifies very high frequency signals along with a phase shift so right now i'm not going to we'll not discuss about phase shift anymore because even though it's an important uh, component of filtering uh, for the purpose of a couple of lectures uh, right now we will not be discussing phase shift as much uh, but we'll get to it maybe a month from now and we'll talk about this phase shift issue as well okay so how do we best represent this fact of lti systems that you you uh, amplify certain signals certain frequencies and you diminish certain other frequencies well you actually represent it with a bode plot and in the bode plot you plot the log of frequency on the x axis and there are two y axis one y axis is about uh, the 20 log base 10 so this is log base 10 of absolute value of h of j omega and the other one is the angle of h of j omega so ignoring the angle of h of j omega which we don't particularly care about right now we notice that the derivative system um, amplifies the high frequency signals and it diminishes the low frequency signal and it becomes evident just by looking at the body plot of the system Okay, that's what we have talked about so far. So in the frequency shaping filter, and I'm going to ignore the phase shift. In the frequency shaping filter, the goal is to amplify the frequencies in a specific format, specific form. Okay, so typically in the case of when you are playing music, you would want to amplify the bass or you would want to amplify the treble or diminish the bass or diminish the treble so that's the kind of filter that's a frequency shaping filter So that's a frequency shaping, shaping filter because you want to shape the frequencies in the output in an appropriate fashion so that it sounds good to the ears. Okay, so that's the goal of frequency shaping filter. Um, it's actually a very, very complicated uh, so given a business requirement that, oh, uh, I want to create a loudspeaker which is good for playing certain kind of music, then you have to spend a lot of time and effort to figure out how to build the entire circuit diagram so that it amplifies certain frequencies in certain fashion and diminishes other frequencies in a certain fashion so that the output sounds pleasing to human ears. Okay, so it's a very complicated problem. And of course, in certain industries, this has already been solved. So for example, in the case of electric currents that comes to our house, 
um, the frequency is always held constant at 60 hertz. And that's the standard in the US and it's 50 hertz in Europe. And um, typically the frequency of the signal, the AC signal that you're receiving at your home would be around 59. So at home, the frequency that you are receiving would be of the order of 59.95 Hertz to 60.05 Hertz. So you can imagine how much complex uh, machinery uh, the AP Ohio or whoever is the utility company in your area they are using in order to make sure that you are getting uh, the frequency of the AC signal that you're getting at your home is balanced and the error is actually very, very small in comparison to the actual frequency. So you have a error of, of the order of 0 0.1 Hertz only, that's the tolerance. So they use a lot of filtering um, as well as a combination of other ways to make sure that the frequencies don't shift that much. The next, uh, what was the other filter? There was frequent, uh, frequency selective filter. There are essentially three types of frequency selective filter. One is the low pass filter. Second is the high pass filter. And the third is the band pass filter. Okay. So in the, the goal of this types of filter is H of J omega, absolute value should be one for certain frequencies. and absolute value of H of J omega equals to zero for other frequencies. Okay, so we want some frequencies to pass through the system without any distortion in the amplitude. Okay, let's, we are ignoring phase for right now. So we want the amplitude to be exactly the same as input for certain frequencies and we want the amplitude to diminish significantly for other frequencies. Okay, so if you are passing the low frequency, so this, this, the fact that your H of J omega is equal to one for certain frequencies, it means that you are passing those frequencies. So a low pass filter passes low frequency signals, a high pass filter passes high frequency signals, and a band pass filter passes uh, an interval of frequencies and doesn't pass other frequencies. So let me draw the ideal Um, ideal uh, body plots. I shouldn't say, I, I don't want to say body plot. Let's just say H of J omega for filters for frequency selective
so we want this is my absolute value of h of j omega omega on the x axis absolute value of h of j omega on the y axis and this is 1 so the absolute value of h of j omega is equal to 1 for let's say omega c minus omega c this is known as a low pass filter ideal Okay, so this is a low pass filter, the ideal high pass filter, omega looks like this. This is a high pass filter. Uh, this is equal to one. So in the ideal low pass filter, if you look at the low frequency signals, if they go through the system, um, they come out unchanged because the amplitude, uh, the amplification factor of ideal low pass filter is equal to one for low frequencies. Whereas if you give it a high frequency signal, it will actually get totally attenuated because of the fact that this doesn't pass high frequency signals. On the other hand, if you look at the high pass filter, the low frequency signals will actually get completely attenuated because the absolute value of H of J omega is equal to zero, is equal to zero for low frequency signals. Whereas the high frequency signal region, the amplification factor is equal to one, which means that the signal will pass through the signal, uh, through the system without any change in the amplitude. Okay, these are all ideal filters. Okay. And then the third type of filter is called a band pass filter. And the band pass filter looks like this. Omega C1, Omega C2.
So in the ideal band pass filters, it allows certain frequencies to, to pass through without attenuation or amplification. Uh, so the amplitude is basically equal to one for absolute value of H of J omega. And for other ranges of frequencies, the signal gets totally annihilated or attenuated um, when they go through the ideal band pass filter. Okay, so these are all ideal filters. And in reality, you cannot construct ideal filters by using uh, real resistors and capacitors and inductors and so on. So you have to always approximate the ideal filters using some specific types of filters. Okay, ideal is good as a theoretical exercise, but in reality, we cannot achieve this ideal situation, but we can get close to it by an appropriate design. An excellent example of a bandpass filter is actually your AC radio, AM radio, amplitude, amplitude modulation radio. So it allows certain frequencies to pass through as you're changing your tuning capacitor. Um, it it uh, changes the station. So there are radio stations that are running at specific frequency and using the, and your AM radio is actually a band pass filter. So it filters out all other frequencies and just narrows down on, on some specific frequency and then amplifies the signal within that frequency. And that's how you get the signal. You get the radio signal and you listen to whatever program is running on that particular radio station. So that's the AM radio. That's a good example of a ideal band pass filter. Well, a band pass filter that is used in our day to day lives. I'm not sure if any of you have actually listened to a radio with a tuning capacitor where you change the capacitor, which changes the band pass frequencies, omega C1, omega C2. Um, most of these things are digital now, so you don't have that feel of changing the capacitance of the tuning capacitor, but I'm not sure if anyone has used it before. Have, have any of you used an AM radio before? With a tuning capacitor? I mean, I've listened to one, I, I've not like messed with it or anything. Okay, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you've listened to it in the car. In the car, most of the AM radios now are sort of digital, um, but, uh, but in the earlier days, there used to be a tuning capacitor where you are actually actively changing the capacitance of the system to catch specific frequencies. It used to be, I mean, it's supposed to be a, a RLC circuit uh, with a tuning capacitor. Okay. So, so this sort of uh, uh, frequency selective filters or frequency shaping filters, they are used heavily in the music industry and the radio industry and television industry and so on, uh, primarily because a lot of the communication now happens uh, through uh, these uh, exponential wave type signals or exponential signals, periodic signals. <coughs> okay. So let's look at the example of an RC circuit and how you can use it as a low pass or a high pass filter, which, which is a real low pass or a real high pass filter. So it will mimic the, uh, the ideal filters, but it's actually not an ideal filter. So it's, a, it's an approximation to an ideal filter. So I have a voltage source VS, that's the input. I have a resistor R and voltage VR across the resistor. I have a capacitor C and the voltage VC across the capacitor. And I can look at two different outputs. So in the first case, my input remains VS. This is my input. I can consider two outputs. The one output is VC. 
which is uh, the output of the system. So I'm just measuring the VC. I'm looking at the voltage across the capacitor, in which case the differential equation is RC dVC over dt plus VCT equals to VST. And the second, I can look at the VC as output. I can look at VR as output. In which case the differential equation is So I have the same circuit and I'm looking at two different outputs. I have the same input, but I could look at the output across the resistor or I could look at the output voltage across the capacitor. So I get two completely different um, differential equations, input output differential equation for that system. Okay, now the goal is find H1 J omega and H2 J omega. So the, the frequency response of system number one and system number two. How should we go about finding it? Any thoughts? So we are given an LTI system and I want to compute the frequency response of the system. So what I'm going to do is I will just input E raised to J omega T as the input signal to the system's differential equation. And remember, I'm going to set VST equals to E raised to J omega T and I know that VC of T equals to H1 J omega E raised to J omega T. So that's how I can compute the value of H1. This VST and VCT equation must satisfy the system number one differential equation. And in the other case, I'm going to set VST equals to E raised to J omega T. I'm going to set VRT equals to H2 of J omega E raised to J omega T. And this VS VR pair must satisfy the differential equation number two. Any questions so far? Okay, so let's find out the value of H1 of J omega. So I know this is my VS. This is the VS I need to pick. This is the VC I need to pick. I'll have one equation, one unknown, and I'll find out what that unknown is. So I will have, so let's look at system number one, I have RC, D over DT H1 J omega E raised to J omega T plus Okay, so I just substituted VS and VC in the differential equation for the first system. And I get this long differential equation. 
and I need to compute the value of H1 of J omega. So can someone help me do it? Let's look at this derivative. What is this derivative equal to? So H1 J omega doesn't depend on time, so it goes out. I have a quick question. Can we get rid of or just divide everything by the e to the j omega t? I can, but I have first have to take the derivative, but that's exactly what I'm going to do. You know, I have to take the derivative and the derivative depends on e raised to j omega t. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I'll do in a, in just two seconds. So let's look at the derivative of this. So this term is constant. So I'll just pull it out of the derivative. The second term depends on time t. So I need to take the derivative. And as someone pointed out earlier, this is j omega e raised to j omega t. So now I get RC J omega H1 J omega e raised to J omega T plus H1 J omega e raised to J omega T equals to e raised to J omega T. And now I can cancel e raised to J omega T eliminate it from the equation and I get So this is my H1 of J omega T, uh, sorry, J omega. And then I can do the similar thing for the second system and I'll get H2 equals to RC J omega over one plus RC J omega. Now let's look at these two frequency responses. Can someone tell me what happens when omega is small versus omega is large? What is the approximate value? I'm just looking at the, let me put the approximation sign here. I'm just looking at the absolute value. I'm not looking at the phase at all. So if what happens- omega, If yeah. omega is large, um, H1 will start to go towards zero. Right. What and about- If it's small? small, I believe it would go to one half, the smaller and smaller it got, or okay. order one. It yeah, one. yeah, it goes to one. What about the second system? I'll let someone else answer that one. Yeah. Be zero for small. Right. And one when it's large, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so for small values of omega, H1 of J omega, the amplitude is equal to one. So it, it passes all the low frequency signals. Um, but it doesn't pass high frequency signals um, through, through itself. 
to this particular system. Whereas if you look at the second system, uh, it doesn't pass low frequency signals, but it passes all the high frequency signals through itself. So this is a simple, this is a single RC circuit, but looking at, depending on whether you're looking at the output across the capacitor or output across the resistor, you get two completely different outputs or uh, frequency response of this particular system. And you can view this as a low pass filter and you can view this as a high pass filter. Okay. Uh, these are real low pass filter and a real high pass filter. They, they don't satisfy the ideal low pass and high pass conditions and we'll see it in the next class, uh, but they are a good low pass and a high pass filter for simpler applications. So that's all I have for today. I'll stick around if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Um, Thank you for your time. Yeah, see you on Wednesday.